Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Let's begin this morning with two misquotes. See if you've heard this one. The proof, um, the lads will uh, bring this up, the proof is in the pudding. And I go, no, it's not. <laughs> the actual saying is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. When the chef exits the kitchen with a magnificent dessert, it could actually taste like cardboard. <laughs> the real test is when you take a, bout, take a bite and you salivate with all these lovely flavors going on in your mouth. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating when you actually take a bite. Now that kind of misquote is neither here nor there. But it is a whole lot more serious when we misquote God's word. See if you've heard this one. Money is the root of all evil. And again I go, no it's not. There is nothing particularly evil about this special piece of paper. What the Bible does say is, it's the love of money, the obsession with money, the lust for money, that is the root of all evil. Here is a parallel passage to the one we're studying this morning, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. These are the kind of folks that James is addressing in chapter 5 of his fascinating letter that we're studying this morning. It's those folks whose obsession in life is to get stuff. Lots of it. To selfishly gain as many material possessions as they possibly can so that they will live in luxury and have more wealth than they could ever spend. Greedily hoarding to themselves while many around them are on the verge of starvation. To these folks, James says, you guys should actually be crying and wailing. There's misery ahead for you. Your number is up. Your world is about to come crashing down around you. You actually should be on your knees lamenting right now because, in effect, I am just going to be announcing your doom. Your possessions are rotted. Your fancy gowns are moth-eaten. And even your gold and silver, which scientifically can't erode, corrode, sorry, they are actually going to rust and decay. And the question I know that you're all asking right now is, why? Why are these rich folks going to come under such severe judgment? Well, it's a one-word answer, folks. Greed. They were selfishly hoarding their wealth to themselves, totally disregarding the needs of those around them. Let me explain to you what was going on in the world of the New Testament. Generally speaking, but especially at harvest time, day workers or day hires would line up very early in the morning to get a shift and to join the reapers in the fields. They would work hard, and at the end of that long, hard day in the sun, they would wait 
to get paid. And Scripture specifically provides for this. Deuteronomy 24, 14 says, You shall not oppress a higher servant who is poor and needy. You shall give him his hire on the day he earns it, before the sun goes down. The breadwinner would then purchase their supper on the way home, and his family would eat. That's how it worked. If he didn't get paid, his family starved. They truly lived hand to mouth. Now, these fat cats, who should have been immensely thankful for the bountiful harvest that God had yet again given them, and you would think would have been generous as a result, Instead, they were mean and greedy and selfish, refusing to pay out these legitimate wages. And God was furious at such terrible injustice. Especially so when these very landlords were living in luxury and self-indulgence. Verse 5 of our passage says, You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You guys remember the prodigal son story? Remember on his return back home, they celebrated. What did they do? They killed the fattened calf. That's what they did. They fattened up this calf and kept it for a special celebration. The inference here is that these rich people gorged themselves so much that they were as fat as the fattened calf. That's the inference of this passage. And here is God's conclusion. You have fattened yourselves with total disregard for anyone else. Worse, you have murdered the innocent one who was causing you no harm who was no threat to you at all. You've essentially murdered them with your meanness. Friends, it is a sad reality that this spirit is still alive and well in our world today. I am no expert, but I think it is a general consensus that the crash of the financial markets all around the world in 2008 was due to greed. And I suspect very little has changed since. Now, I want you to understand this morning that not everything about business is bad. It is profitable enterprise that creates wealth for the nation, that funds worthy services like the NHS, and many other services that we benefit from. And not all profits in business can be shared. Some need to be responsibly reinvested in the business to ensure further growth for the benefit of everyone concerned. But I've got to say this morning that it is hugely concerning that one of the first acts of the last Prime Minister was to lift the cap on the amount that fat cat bankers can earn in bonuses when they are already earning a fortune. Now, I feel I have some right to speak to this. During my 17 years in business, on the front end of my career, as directors of the company and as Christians to boot, we had to decide what to do with our profits. Very challenging when you've got money. You think it's bad not having any. Just as bad having some. Before God, we decided that as a year-end bonus, we would give every one of our 85 employees an additional week's wages. Gross. The company even paid the tax element for them. 
so that each family in our employment would have a worry-free Christmas. And in recent years, there have been good developments like profit-sharing schemes introduced for employees and initiatives like allocating share ownership uh, to some degree to employees to register the management's genuine appreciation for consistent, excellent work over the year. So, it's not all bad. But here is the bottom line. Here is the enduring principle at play here. Unjust, self-indulgent bosses who are totally dismissive and who disregard their staff and treat them like dirt, bosses like that will be judged. And their hoarded wealth will perish with them. That's the teaching of James from James chapter 5. Now I want you to notice as we enter the second half of our passage, there is a distinct change of tone. James, James now turns from the oppressors to the oppressed. He moves from strident condemnation of the rich to tender affection for his brothers and sisters in Christ who are being exploited. And he instructs his brothers and sisters how they should be behaving under such injustice. See, the answer for those who follow Jesus is not to get out the boxing gloves and go to war. We have not to rebel and try and take matters into our own hands. That just leads to anarchy and benefits nobody. So, James's argument is that it is patient endurance that has to be the posture for the Christian. Remember, Jesus himself said that in this hostile world, we would encounter trouble. So don't be surprised at injustice in our society. It's not heaven yet. We are living in enemy territory, folks. And James goes on to highlight three examples of folks who exhibited this patient endurance. First, from the natural world, the farmer. In verse 7, he mentions the early rain, which was the first to fall after the sowing of the seed, helping it to germinate. The latter rain would eventually follow, swelling the grain just before harvest time. The farmer faithfully sowed, carefully cultivated, and then patiently waited for God to fulfill his promise, which was, seed time and harvest shall not fail. So in the farming world, patient endurance is a necessary virtue. Second, he refers to the prophets. Almost by definition, the task of the prophet was really tough. Invariably, they would be sent from God with a message to the people who didn't want to hear it. And the persecution of the prophets was simply a fact of history. So much so that Stephen, if you remember, at his martyrdom in Acts chapter 7, cried out, Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? Now, says James, if they suffered so much yet endured so courageously, should not we in our generation be encouraged to bear our smaller burdens with the same resolute faith? Thirdly, James mentions <clears throat> specifically the man Job. In verse 11 of our passage, even today we speak about the patience of Job. Now, he wasn't perfect. He made his mistakes too, at times. 
On occasions, he lost his cool, but through all his suffering, Job retained his steadfast faith in God. At the end of that terrible day, you remember, when he lost his entire family and all his thousands and thousands of cattle, he fell to the ground in anger. Mm -mm. He fell to the ground in worship. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall depart. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken, taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job's patient endurance, says James, is outstanding and an example to us all. God's purpose for Job and for all of us is always loving and kind and for our highest good. In Job's case, the end was glorious. The Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. And my question to you this morning is, how does our patient endurance stack up when we are suffering loss and injustice? James' teaching is pretty clear, I think. The farmer waits, the prophets waited, Job waited. And we in our generation should wait patiently too. For what, you ask? Ah, I was just coming to that. I want to conclude this morning with three massive lessons that I believe God wants us to learn from this fascinating passage. The first, wait. Patiently endure. Let God be God. Let him right the wrongs. Don't rebel. Don't take matters into your own hands. I put it to you, folks, that this is a question of faith. How much do we trust God? Do we really believe that he is in total control of our world affairs? Do we believe that he will, as promised, hold every oppressor, every unjust boss to account? Do we believe that in the end our compassionate Heavenly Father will see that justice is done? Do we believe that? Here is Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18, you may remember he is wrestling with God, pleading that God would spare the few good people in the wicked city of Sodom. Abraham understood that the power was not in his hands. He knew that he had to put his trust in the Lord. And he concluded in verse 25 of Genesis 18, Shall not the judge of the whole earth do what's right. And we, in our time, need to trust that God will do what's right. And our role, hard though it may be, is to patiently endure. That's the first thing. Secondly, don't obsessively pursue money as an end in itself. You will never win, folks. You will never be satisfied. Enough is never enough. You will be driven to make more and more. Now, of course we have to act responsibly. Of course we have to be good parents and provide food and clothing and shelter for our families. Of course we have. And as we were hearing this morning already, that in itself is a huge challenge in these days of raging inflation and soaring utility bills. Of course it's a challenge. But never, please, never let these legitimate needs drive you to make money your God. That's the point that James is making where you live the good life, which at heart is really just a selfish lifestyle. 
when there are so many needs around us that we need to help. Way back in the early days of our ministry, we encountered a lovely young couple and she knew what she wanted right from the get-go. It was the best of everything was her agenda. Unfortunately, he struggled to deliver on her expectations and spent every hour he could trying to achieve that luxurious standard of living that his wife demanded. He spent way more time on the job than at home. He spent more time with a work colleague than he did with his wife. You see where this is going? He ended up having an affair at the office and his marriage fell apart. Not good. And by the way, I do hope that no one here believes that winning the lottery is the answer to all your problems. Here are the facts. 70%, 70% of all lottery winners blow it, all of it, in five years or less. Friends, I am pleading with you this morning. Don't greedily pursue money. Don't join the rat race of consumerism in today's society. Materialistic gain is nothing short of madness and will end up you destroying relationships in your life that's really, really precious to you. Here's the final thing. Be vigilant. Get ready. The judge is standing at the door. The whole thrust of this passage from James is that we have not to spend our time obsessively pursuing wealth, which is so temporary and which never satisfies. Rather, we should be focusing on getting our heart right with God. And there is urgency to this, folks. There really is. Time is short. The day of accountability is almost upon us. Jesus, the judge, is standing at the door, says James. Get prepared. That's what we should be focusing our energies on. And friends, I just want to say, this includes every single one of us sitting in God's house at this moment. If we are committed Christians and authentic followers of Jesus, for us, the accountability is the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we'll appear. Let me point out very quickly that this has nothing to do with punitive judgment. The judgment seat was where issues were assessed and settlements agreed and awarded. And it will be the same as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not to have our sins dealt with. His atoning death took care of that, for which we will be eternally thankful. What is going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ is that our lives as Christians will be assessed fairly and service that has been done for God and for the extension of his kingdom with a pure motive will unbelievably be rewarded. And we will hear his well done good and faithful servant. But that day of review is coming for all true followers of Jesus. 
We're going to stand before the Lord and account for how we've lived for him. That's very searching. For those who never did make that commitment to follow Jesus, who remained sitting on the fence for just too long, it will be the great white throne that they will stand before, which is simply a terrifying thought. Because what is addressed at the great white throne is how we have responded to God's offer of forgiveness, which Jesus has made a available to all mankind at colossal cost to himself. Every person who has placed their faith in Jesus, Revelation tells us, will have their name registered in the book of life. The huge question I ask you to face as we close this morning, is simply this. Is my name recorded in the book of life? So says James in his very, very practical letter. These are the critical issues that we need to spend time considering rather than the meaningless pursuit of wealth, which is so transient and which in the end never satisfies. Endure patiently. Don't obsessively pursue money and get ready because the judge is standing at the door. Let's pray together. Lord, I get more excited the older I get at the unbelievable relevance of your word. And we really have been enjoying um, this practical study in James' amazing little letter. Help us to remember and face up to these challenges from the pen of James this morning. In a world where we've got to react, stand up for our rights, go to war, get mad, James says, no, for the Christ follower, you have to patiently endure. In a rat race, materialistic, consumer-driven society, don't get obsessive about accumulating wealth and prioritize the right things. Jesus is coming. Every one of us is going to uh, stand before him. Whether it's the great white throne or the judgment seat of Christ, we'll all answer, Father. What searching words these are. Help us to assess our lives, Lord, in the light of your word and take action where required. We humbly ask for the glory of your name. Amen.